Have you ever had a game that you wanted to play but were nervous that it's aged too poorly for you to get into it? System Shock, developed by Looking Glass Studios, is one of those for me. I'd been interested in giving this one a chance, seeing as how it significantly influenced first-person and action-adventure titles going forward. I mean, this game basically codified how sci-fi shooters should behave, and you can trace a lot of modern FPS design back to this, just as much as games like Wolfenstein and Doom. Its reputation precedes itself, which freaked me out enough to keep pushing this one off. What finally convinced me to give it a try was the upcoming remake by Night Dive Studios, the company responsible for reviving several old properties and re-releasing them on modern hardware, including System Shock 1 and 2. The remake is, supposedly, out this month, and just from playing the demo, I'm excited to give it a shot. But before I do, I figured it was finally time to see where the remake spawned from in the first place. Luckily for me, Night Dive released an enhanced edition of System Shock, which ports the game to the Kex engine, upscales the resolution, and implements a modern control scheme. I'm playing that for this video, mainly to find a neutral ground between the classic version and what I'm used to playing. Besides the technical stuff, it's the same game as it was released in 1994, so it's time for me to hack into Citadel Station and finally see what I've been missing. Welcome back to Citadel Station. We hope your somnolent healing stage went well. Today is the 6th day of November, year 2072. Now, if you're like me, you'll spend your first half hour figuring out these damn controls. Moving the hacker around is not as simple as it seems, thanks to some floaty movement and unorthodox key bindings, and this might make or break your ability to enjoy this game. This came out before WASD became the standard, and while Enhanced Edition uses this layout, that's not how players controlled this when it launched in the 90s. Especially in the cyberspace sections, which are admittedly pretty cool looking, you're going to grapple with the controls and physics as a first time player. You figure it out eventually, but it's certainly archaic. Some things I had to relearn entirely, like crouching. Switching between standing, crouching, and lying prone is done with the R, F, and V keys, and your first instinct might be, well, that's odd. But if you look at your keyboard, assuming it's a QWERTY layout, you'll notice they're all vertically aligned. So there is a logic to these controls. They're strange, but intuitive. You still might have a lot of trouble figuring out the UI, or at least I struggled with it. The game wants you to use the mouse to select items on your UI and shoot and interact with things simultaneously, which is why using your weapon is done with the right mouse button, I suppose. That was easy enough to figure out and get used to, but switching between using the mouse to move the camera and selecting something from my inventory never felt right. There are keyboard shortcuts that mitigate this a bit, and it isn't a big deal when you're in a safe location. But it is an enormous deal when a bunch of enemies are on screen, as it's very likely that they'll kill you because you need to reload your flechette gun. And dying is a severe concern in System Shock. If you lose all of your health, you're taken to a cybernetic conversion chamber and are reborn as a soldier for the rogue AI Shodan. System Shock has no autosave system, so unless you're dutiful about manually saving, and I was only sort of dutiful, you might lose a lot of progress. Thankfully, you can find the conversion chamber on your current floor and configure it to respawn you with all your human parts intact, which gives you essentially unlimited lives, but only for that floor, and not every level has one of these. So if you play this game, I recommend saving as often as possible on each floor before switching the restoration chamber and right before and after you enter another floor. Why before and after? Well, Shodan has this devious thing where she loves setting up traps for you right as you leave the elevator on a new floor, and if you're not ready for it, you might instantly die, get cyber converted, and have to reload in the middle of the previous level. So I learned to save right before this happened in case the game threw me a deadly curveball, then again afterward so I didn't have to deal with it again. But even if you've got the restoration chamber set up, these enemies can steamroll you if you're unprepared. I say can because the enemy AI sometimes felt very inconsistent. Sometimes they sniped me from somewhere before I ever saw them coming. Sometimes I had a direct sight line to me but just chose to keep walking around. I don't know exactly how the enemy's vision is determined, maybe it's based on their position or where their sprite is facing. Regardless, I counted several times when an enemy dawdled around when they should have been killing me. But when they are on target, they can take you down in a heartbeat. 
Especially on later floors, these guys packed a wallop, even if some had pretty poor defenses. Once I learned how they attacked, most stock mutants and cyborgs weren't too bad, but the advanced enemies gave me trouble. These assassin cyborgs are incredibly annoying since their attacks are silent. Even if they don't have a ton of health, they are often hidden in locations that let them kill me before I could even find them. Others are annoying because of their range. I always winced whenever I saw a hopper, especially in the early levels. Partially it's their sprite, which looks... weird, but also because they can get you from deceptively far away. But the worst was the damn invisible mutants, because, well, they're nearly invisible, and probably killed me more than anything else in this game. You already can't see well on this floor thanks to the lighting, and even when I had more powerful weapons, they were still irritating little pests. Speaking of weapons, there are several in System Shock that all feel unique to a degree. While these weapons are in set positions on each map, there are multiple pickups for most weapons throughout the game, so if you missed one earlier, you can still grab it later if you look hard enough. Yet with only 7 weapon slots at your disposal, you will have to pick favorites. Some are definite improvements over other models. I mean, the Magnum is a better pistol, so there's no reason to have both. By the 6th level, my arsenal was set. Once I had the Laser Rapier and Scorpion SMG, that's almost exclusively what I used, except for the Magnum to take down cameras, and occasionally the Railgun for encounters in open spaces. But the greatest offense against these creeps is leaning around corners, which is undoubtedly your best tactic. This saved me more than anything else, and the hacker can bend surprisingly far, giving you a good field of vision. Back to the weapons, however. One issue I have with System Shock is that it's not balanced very well. Most of these weapons are practical, but by the mid-game, you find weapons that are such a leap in practicality that they render everything else obsolete. Except for the beginning, when I only had a few tools at my disposal, I never ran out of ammo. Enemies dropped them at pretty generous rates, and there's plenty scattered around if you explore. The enemies gave me trouble if they got to me, but I could mow them down pretty efficiently by the end if I had the jump on them. On the whole, I'd argue that System Shock is challenging, but fair. You can't just go in guns blazing and expect to get anywhere, but if you're careful, you can overcome whatever the game throws at you. But if you find things too complicated, the game lets you set your level of challenge, adjusting four different variables on a scale from 0 to 3. I played with everything on standard settings, but you can, for instance, reduce the difficulty of the combat or puzzles independently from each other. This is a brilliant system, it's more accessible, and lets players define precisely the challenge they want, even outright bypassing specific mechanics. You can even adjust the amount of story content, ranging from having every door already open and getting rid of audio logs to playing with a time limit. I was genuinely surprised by how accommodating System Shock was. You obviously can't expect something as fine-tuned as modern shooters are, but I was able to get situated in pretty quickly. Of course, some of that is the Enhanced Edition and its improvements, and without playing the classic version to compare, I'm certainly not the best person to judge. The remake might even supplant all of this, but that's not out yet, so I can't say for sure. No matter how you play System Shock, one thing you'll probably notice right away are the 3D environments. You have to remember that full 3D action-heavy games were scarce when this came out, so technically, these levels are incredibly innovative. And yeah, games like Wolfenstein and Ultima Underworld were in 3D, but they all lacked height. System Shock featured levels that scale vertically instead of just into the foreground, with ramps, steps, and slopes everywhere. It might look primitive now, but it gives this such a distinct feel compared to other space stations, which is about the most basic sci-fi setting you can get. Citadel Station is incredibly engaging, and the art and models enhance that. The textures are bizarre, bright and colorful while still feeling cold and mechanical, simultaneously inviting and uninviting. Each station level has its own visual identity thanks to the color palette and sprites. I loved how the more affluent areas of the ship, like residential and executive floors, contrasted in tone and roughness against the working levels, like maintenance and the flight deck. I also really enjoyed the intricate lighting system, with many areas cast in shadows or total darkness to enhance the mood. But something I wasn't expecting was the music by Greg Lopiccolo, or rather, I wasn't expecting it to be so... intense? I guess I went in expecting System Shock would be more horror-focused, and to be clear, this is not a horror game. Treating it as such would be a huge disservice. So the soundtrack was a little jarring in how energetic and invigorating it is. 
Nevertheless, it's good music, and I especially like how it switches between different versions on the fly depending on your situation or location. I should add, though, that I played this game with a sound font by Steam user DeusNSF installed. System Shock uses MIDI files, which sound pretty terrible coming through the default Windows sound font. After I had to scrap my first recording session and start over thanks to an encoding error, I installed this mod as a replacement. Deus NSF specifically designed this sound font for System Shock, making the game sound much better. Any sound font will probably work well enough, of course, it's just a matter of preference and what sounds best to you. But again, the music itself is very good, and helped contribute to System Shock's atmosphere, which I loved, as it's been a while since I played a game that scared me like this. Again, this isn't a horror game, but there is something about navigating an abandoned space station with monsters and killer robots roaming around that is inherently terrifying. It's probably more accurate to call this a tense game rather than a scary one, but I was almost always apprehensive about what was ahead. Some of that is the fear of losing progress, but it's also the claustrophobic design of Citadel Station and Shodan's omnipresent nature that puts you on edge. Oh, I should probably talk about Shodan now, as she is the most iconic part of System Shock. Now, a rogue AI gaining sentience and calling itself a god is nothing new. Even back then, this was an established trope. But man, I love what they did with Shodan. Having her semi-frequently taunt the hacker was a brilliant move. You can hear her panic as you climb further up the station, disrupting her plans and pissing her off. Terry Brosius delivers an excellent performance, mechanical and lifeless, but still piercing with rage, and all the audio manipulation adds extra creepiness. My, my whims will become lightning bolts that devastate the mounds of humanity. Out of the chaos, they will run and whimper, praying for me to end their tedious anarchy. I just wish the voice acting as a whole was better, because the rest is pretty garbage. Not criticizing the script, because that's fine for the most part, but Looking Glass relied on its employees to voice these characters, and my god, it shows. You're not interacting with anybody directly in this game, it's all audio logs, some ramping the cheesiness level up to 11. Special shout out to Edward Diego, who'd be intimidating if he didn't open his mouth. Hey Shodan, take a letter. Dear Tryup, please send some more people to investigate me. I run security, I run the robots, I'm jamming communications. That's right, Rebecca, investigate me, investigate my butt. What I do like, though, is the sound design that goes into some of these logs, especially toward the middle of the game. Many of them depict battles between the Citadel Station crew and Shodan cyborgs, and maybe they seem like small details, but they do help the storytelling immensely. These crates give us good position, but I don't see a way to break through the life pods. Beth and Imran, see if you can get down to where it says Flight Bay 2. In the end, System Shock was a game that, appropriately enough, shocked me all the way through. It was surprisingly accessible with the Enhanced Edition, remarkably modern in how it redefined first-person gaming, and tons of fun to play. I figured I'd enjoy System Shock on a higher level, appreciating its influence on the industry, even if I couldn't get into the gameplay. But as it turns out, I can do both, and I love that I can do both. I highly recommend giving System Shock a try, with the caveat that you'll need to adjust your expectations accordingly. The remake may end up being a better way to play this game, and I'm intrigued to find out if I'll enjoy it having played the original. And before you ask, I will look at System Shock 2 at some point, not anytime soon, but I know people love that one as well. With that, and the maybe going to happen System Shock 3, we might see this seminal franchise reborn and once again dominating the scene. We can only hope. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe to see more and leave a like and a comment down below.